see you all tonight. I think some people thought the game was tonight because they uh, stayed, stayed out. But I'm glad you came back. Uh, I must have cut off the Wi-Fi at this church. Uh, we had a whole bunch of people over here cell phoning uh, Sunday night. That part is empty now. So they must have cut the Wi-Fi off here at the church. But it's good to see you. And uh, tonight we'll be in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. And let's just see how this works. I've been thinking that there's so much good stuff in this chapter. We might just do it tonight and try to do four and five tomorrow night. That sounds like a major challenge, but four and five are actually short chapters. And uh, the, I don't know of anything more interesting than you know, 1 Peter chapter 3, where we get to start off talking about the husbands and wives, and then we end up with the spirits in prison. But... Uh, I've got to go to the doctor myself in the morning. Uh, I'd appreciate you praying for me. It's, it's just to follow up to blood work. But I, my feelings are still hurt. Last time I went, she told me I was fat. And I said, I'd like a second opinion. She said, you're ugly too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they don't have much confidence in me at the doctor's office. I have to pay in cash because they're not ever sure I'll live long enough to come back. And uh, she told me not to get any green bananas. Anyway, uh, maybe we'll make it one more night at least. <laughs> Ansley, all this is for you. But uh, in the first part of 1 Peter chapter 3, the first seven verses, he talks about husbands and wives. And uh, naturally, you can't handle this without... Uh, saying a few funny things that are, are jokes that may not be funny to you. But a story is told about a man who was walking along on the beach in California and he saw a golden lamp sticking up out of the sand. And he picked it up, polished it off, and out popped the proverbial genie. The genie says, you may have one wish. And the man said, I've always wanted to go to Hawaii, but he said, I, I'm afraid of flying and uh, riding in a, in a boat makes me seasick. He said, what I want you to do is build me a bridge from California to Hawaii. The genie looked at him and said, are you crazy? He said, have you thought about the logistics involved in doing something like that, how deep the ocean is and, and, and all of that? So he said, you'll have to make another wish. And he said, well, I wish that I could understand women. The genie thought for a moment and said, do you want your bridge with two lanes or four? <laughs> uh, a husband and wife were in a heated argument one day and the husband said to his wife, said, I don't know how you can be so beautiful and dumb at the same time. She said, oh, that's easy. She said, the Lord made me beautiful so you would love me and made me dumb so I'd love you. Did you know the average woman says 30,000 words a day and the average man 15,000? The reason for that is the women have to repeat everything because the husband isn't listening the first time. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, Helen Rowland, whoever that is, I just read the quote, said that uh, in the Old Testament, uh, sacrifices were made on the altar and things hadn't changed much. They still are. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin said, have your eyes wide open before you get married and half closed afterwards. But anyway, we have seven verses, six of them pertain to the women and only one to the men. So you might think, well, this is unfair. But there's a parallel passage in Ephesians chapter 5. And in that passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, there's eight verses to the men and three to the women. So if you add it up, it comes out to nine verses to each one. But now there are uh, uh, marriage, seriously, I really do wish everybody that was married would be here tonight. This, this is good. It, it may not be good the way I teach it, but it is good stuff. But uh, this is not everything that the Bible has to say about marriage. You'd have to, there's several places you'd have to go to. So don't think that because we go over these verses that we'll know everything about marriage. And please understand that I am not a marriage counselor and I do not profess to be a perfect husband. I have not been a good husband at all, to be honest with you. 
my, my wife has been gracious to put up with me. Uh, I have learned a lot of things. The problem about marriage is about the time you figure out, you know, how to do it is you're too old and, uh, you know, it's just too late. <laughs> I wish I'd have known uh, what I knew, know now when I, when I got married, but uh, the sad thing is you can get married and know nothing. See, to get a driver's license, you have to pass the test. But you can go to get a marriage license and know nothing. And most people don't. But uh, it, it continues the topic here of submission. And I know some of you aren't going to like this, but this is what the Bible says. This is not what I said or what the Baptists teach. This is what the Bible says. Submission does not mean slavery. It means that you place yourself under the authority of somebody else. And the Bible is very clear that the wife is to place herself under the authority of a loving husband. The Bible never tells women to do ungodly stuff just because your husband tells you to. But uh, that's why, you know, we're to submit in the Lord. So let's look at this. In verse 1 he says, Likewise, uh, well, let me just say this. This passage is basically dealing with uh, how a, a Christian woman can help her husband to be saved. See, that's why I entitled it on the outline, How to Win a Husband. Uh, it means how to, because see, almost every church, I think everyone I've ever been in, but now I, has had more women in it than men. And there are a lot of women who come faithfully Sunday after Sunday by themselves. And I know they'd want their husband to be saved. And, and so here is some advice on how to help get your husband saved. That's the primary goal here. But there's a lot of other stuff we can learn. He says, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. All right, again now, that word subjection just simply means under your husband's authority. Now, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that the husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. If Christ loved the church enough to die for the church, that means the husband should love his wife enough to die for her. Ladies, don't you know that if your husband loves you enough to die for you, that you could be in submission to him? See, men and women are equal, but they're not identical. They're equal, but they're not identical. God has roles, and submission is one of the hardest things to do. And I'll be honest with you, you'll never submit to your husband or anybody else until you have first submitted to God. And the battle over submission, and I did not know this now. This is what I've learned studying 1 Peter. It goes back to the Garden of Eden, to Genesis 3.16 is where the battle started. And in that passage, it's not real clear in the King James now, so you might need to get you another translation and look at it. When God came in the garden after Eve and, and Adam had disobeyed, God came in the garden Basically, he said to Eve, he said, your desire is to control your husband, or rule, but he will rule over you. That's when the fight started in, in the Garden of Eden. Isn't that amazing? Eve, you'll really want to be in control, but your husband will have some subject, uh, you know, you'll be subjected to him. Just check it out. And the battle over submission has nothing to do with our culture. It goes back to the doctrine of the creation and the fall because man was created first and then woman, 1 Timothy 2.13. Adam was created first and then Eve. He says, wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Now watch this. It's going to sound contradictory. That if any obey not the word, in other words, if the husband's not interested in the Bible, they may also, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, ladies, this is very important. Uh, and, of course, most of you, you know, are husband and wives are here tonight, but I also, I'm going to assure you 
on Sunday morning, there'll be some women that'll show up at this church without their husbands. He says that if your husband will not be won by the word, he, uh, you can win him by the conversation of the wives. Now that sounds contradictory because on one hand he says they're not going to be won by the word and then he says they can be won by the conversation. So what is a conversation? That's words, isn't it? But that's not what it means here. It means your lifestyle. In other words, if your husband is not interested in church and he's not interested in God's word, he will watch your lifestyle when you get home from church and see how you act. You'll have more of an influence. Uh, I, I've never believed that women should win their husbands by preaching to him every Sunday about how sorry he is for not getting up and going with them to church or to nag him or to go home and tell him what the preacher said you know, about him. Uh, husbands, verse 2 makes it even clearer. It says, while, while they behold your chaste conversation. Chaste there meaning and remember, conversation means your behavior. Chaste means pure and, and modest, godly behavior. In other words, the husband, ladies, you will not win your husband by preaching him a sermon. But you can get a lot further by showing him how a Christian should live. What you do will drown out what you say. But uh, that's very important. But See, it, it makes that verse clear because otherwise when you read verse 1, it talks about, yeah, they can't, if they're not won by the word, they can be won by the conversation, but it means your behavior. They will, and that word behold in verse 2 means to focus on. Now here I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Now I didn't always know this now. And a husband that is not saved, that has a godly wife that goes to church every Sunday, that husband may act like he's not interested in church, but that word behold means he's watching her. The husband will watch you and see how you live, even though he may say that he's not interested in it. So, so don't give up. Or if you know ladies like this, you know, if you, some of your friends at work, maybe they have a husband that's obstinate, uh, and, and that wife says, I don't know what to do. I go home and pound him over the head every Sunday with a Bible, and it's not doing any good. No, that's not going to work. But he is watching you, even though it may not look like it. So let me rephrase this. The husband is watching you even though he's not listening to you. All right? Coupled with fear. That word fear there, again, does not mean, uh, you know, a fear as in you're afraid of somebody, but it means respect. Now, again, I don't want to sound like a smart aleck now. And I certainly, uh, I've told you all that I am not the perfect example here. But what a man wants more than anything else is respect. That's the greatest need of a man. That's why that's what that word fear means. Coupled with respect. Ladies, don't go home and preach to your husband. But let him see your godly behavior coupled with respect. That's what a man desires more than anything else. That's why men will get together and talk about killing a 12-point deer or a 14-point deer or, or some deer. Maybe they ran over him on the road or something, you know. But they, they're talking about the, uh, uh, how big a deer they killed, and the women are thinking, eh, I'm so bored listening to this, you know. I could care less about how big the deer was and all that. It's important, though, to your husband. He wants respect. Don't put your husband down in front of other people. Unless you know, I mean, if you know they're joking, but uh, to, to say something negative, um, and especially in front of the children. But women, their greatest need is to be loved. See, this is a difference. Difference between men and women. God made them equal, but we're not identical. Uh, men want to be respected. That's why a man's always telling you what he has done. A woman wants to be loved. A woman has a greater need for security than a man does. Uh, so he says here to the women again in verse 3, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, and by the way, adorning is the Greek word cosmos from which we get our word cosmetic. 
whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating, which is braiding the hair, or of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. So the, so the debate used to rage in the church. I, I don't hear it anymore about uh, women, you know, wearing makeup and stuff like that. Um, if it is a sin for a woman to wear jewelry, then it's a sin for her to wear clothes because it says in the same verse, whose outward adorning let it, in other words, don't let your beauty be just what you are outwardly, but he also mentions the putting on of apparel. Somebody asked Dr. J. Vernon McGee one time, do you think it was a sin for a woman to wear makeup? He said, I think it's a sin for some of them not to. <laughs> uh, the classic. All right. All he means here in verse 3 is, ladies, let your real beauty be from within. That will grow more precious as the years go by. I don't care who you are. You may be the homecoming queen, but the outward behave, the beauty will fade. And if you don't believe it, go to your 40th or 50th class reunion and, and look at some of these people, and you won't believe that they were uh, what they were in high school. That outward beauty will, will fade, but the inward beauty will remain. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs 31, 30, talking about the godly woman. Beauty is deceitful. Charm is a delusion. The years will take care. The years are an equal opportunity. Uh, ager, I guess, you know, it uh, happens to men and women. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, even though he's talking to women here. He says, which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. Uh, there's no Botox for that inward beauty. The inward beauty will remain. It goes on to say, for after this manner also in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah, I know you ladies love this verse. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, uh, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, I'd never call that sorry thing I'm married to, Lord. You know, I, I, there's a couple things you need to be aware of here. First of all, did you notice that Lord is in small letters? It means master. It doesn't mean Lord like the Lord in heaven. It's not like. Now, here's a second thought, and I didn't realize this either until I studied in this. If you'll go back to that passage where Sarah does that, it's, it's Genesis 18, verse 12. If you'll go back and look it up, you will see that Sarah said this to herself. She did not go around publicly calling Abraham Lord. In other words, it was her thoughts that she was going to submit to him. But uh, So that makes that verse a lot easier to deal with. So there are several things here that women are told. Uh, but now let's look at the men in verse 7. Because it's only one verse, but boy is it loaded. Every, every little phrase here is important. All right, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands. The word husband comes from the word house band. He's supposed to band the house together, hold the house together. He may not be doing it, but that's what it's supposed to be. Ye house bands... Dwell with them. Okay? That's the first thing I want to point out. A husband should dwell with his wife. Now you're thinking, well, that's crazy. We know that. We go to the same house. We, you know, we, uh, but see, here's the problem. Some men would rather spend Friday night with their buddies hunting or fishing or doing th than to be with their wife ought not to be so it doesn't mean the husband and the wife have to be together 24 hours a day 7 days a week but the husband should enjoy being with his wife if he enjoys the company of the good old boys and more than his wife the priorities are out of, out of whack it's something the Lord showed me one time I didn't learn this in the book about Joseph in the Old Testament remember when he was sold into slavery to Potiphar and Potiphar's wife 
made advances toward Joseph, the Lord revealed to me one time, and I'm not saying I'm the only person in the world that knows this. I, I'm not that I'm not thinking that God told me and when I die nobody will know this. Uh, but the reason Potiphar's wife had such a crush on Joseph is Potiphar was never there. He wasn't home. When men spend more time away and sometimes, you know, they have to, truckers and stuff like that. But if a man chooses to spend time that should be spent with his wife, and in order to do something with his friends, that's trouble. That should be a warning light on your engine. Uh, warning light. And then it says, dwell with them according to knowledge. Now I implied in the joke I told you first uh, uh, that you can't understand women and uh, men. And you know, you're always hearing that, that I just don't understand how a woman thinks and blah, blah, blah. Well, men and women are different. As I said, men want respect. They want to be known for what they have accomplished. A woman wants to be known for what she is. That's a difference. There are obviously physical differences, but there are great emotional differences in men and women. And men should learn, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that you'll ever learn at all I've learned some stuff about Janice just in the last three or four years. It's been there all the time. She hadn't changed. What happened is I just realized, you know, this is the way she is. And if I had learned this 30 years ago, it would have been a lot better. Or 50 years ago. But learn. Now, for example, your wife is more sensitive than you are. Because of that, women are more offended if you forget a birthday, an anniversary, or if they have bought a new outfit and you haven't complimented them on it, or if they've had their hair cut, I have trouble with this. I'll, I stay in the doghouse on this one. I don't know why my wife even goes to the... The only reason I know she has a haircut is I see the little card where she's got an appointment because she never has it cut. You know, I never can tell, but if I better say something when she gets home. Uh... But see, women are offended by stuff. And now men could care less. Some of you might not even know your anniversary. You, you'd have to stop and think about uh, But women, that's important. Uh, women are more observant than men. I'll guarantee you if I could take all the men in this church out of this building for a few minutes and ask you what's the color of the carpet in this church, Half of you wouldn't know and you come here every Sunday. Men just don't notice. My wife is always, whatever church, because I go to a different church, as you know, I mean, when they get a real preacher, I leave and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, and my wife will say, uh, well, I, I don't like the way they did so-and-so or whatever. And I've never even noticed it. I've been to Swain's funeral home and Nobles a bunch of times. I couldn't tell you what color the carpet is down there. I, see, we don't notice. Women would make better detectives because they notice clues. They notice things. My wife's always asking me, did you see so-and-so? No, I didn't see it. There was a buzzard there in the middle of the road. You didn't see him? No. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's the way. And women, well, let's go on here. It says, according to knowledge, giving honor, which means a man should be gentlemanly, which we southern gentlemen are, uh, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, a lot of you women are saying, boy, that's a joke. Uh, I, some of you might say, well, I could Indian wrestle and, and beat my husband arm wrestling. Folks, that says more about your husband than it does you. Uh, the only reason Peter says this, this is the only reason, is that men are physically stronger than women. Now, if you put some barbells and dumbbells and stuff like that over here in the gym and said, we're going to have a weightlifting contest here at Mount Vernon, I don't doubt that there might be a woman in this church that could lift more weight than her husband. But I will guarantee you that the winner of the contest will be male. Did you all see any girls playing in the game last night? But you see female announcers now. 
That's another one of my pet peeves. I am not going to go there. But I, I, I despise that. Uh, the men should be announcing the football games. If the women want to announce the basketball, I'm not that, but football. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's a political, in, political correctness that we're, in, you know, ESPN's bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. But anyway, uh, a woman is stronger in many ways than a man. For example, a woman, let's, let's just say this. Suppose uh, somebody in the family, one of the children's sick, uh, who's going to sit up with them all night? What if they're in the hospital? Who's going to stay in there with them? Now, if a man does, he might stay in there, but he'll be asleep by 1 o'clock. He might spend the night in that room, but he don't know what's going on. But the, I'm known of women to go out to that hospital, have a sick husband, stay right there all day and only go home enough to take a bath and change clothes and they'll be right back. We, men can't do that. Women are more devoted to Christ overall now. Remember who was last at the gar, uh, t uh, cross and first at the tomb? Devoted women. Okay, Women outlive men. Average woman in America lives to be 81 the average man, 76. You ladies live five years on the average longer than men. Of course, that's, all that's general. You know, We all know that uh, that doesn't always hold true in every case, but that's the average. So when he says weaker vessel, he's simply meaning in physical strength. The average man is taller and heavier than the average woman. All right, then he says... As and, and this one, uh, so you might be thinking, well, you know, this is nice to know this, but I'm not going to use it. But he says, as being heirs together, the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, that one gets me. You can say, well, I'm not, I'm not interested in knowing about my wife or my husband or whatever. <laughs> the Bible says if we don't get along, our prayers are going to be hindered. It's going to be pretty hard to pray when you're not speaking to each other, isn't it? So that's very important. All right, now, I'm going to try to hurry through these next verses so we can get to the spirits in prison. My time's going to run out. Finally, be all of one mind. He tells us here as believers, if we're going to inherit a blessing, we need to be of one mind, one focus. Uh, he's not just talking about husbands and wives now. He's talking about believers. Having compassion, that word compassion means to feel with uh, when somebody hurts you feel now we use the word compassion to refer to when somebody is dies or has a tragedy but in the bible it was also used to refer to when somebody was rejoicing about something and that's why the bible says uh we know where to weep with them that weep and rejoice with them that rejoice compassion work both ways but in our culture today we think of compassion only as you know, well, I'm sorry that happened. Uh, you know, we have our prayers, our sympathies. Um, then he says, uh, love as brethren. See, everybody in this church should be just one big family, right? A lot of the family's out tonight, but uh, out on the town. But uh, a church should be just a, a big family. Now, I know every church has got politics in it. I wish it did. And I wish I could just say, oh, well, this, you know, everybody in this church is just like they claim to be. But basically, a church should be a family. Uh, when one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. So he says, love is brethren. That's the word phileo, by the way. Be pitiful. Now, again, that's one about like being a peculiar last night. That doesn't mean what you think it does. You know, a lot of us look sort of pitiful, especially if our team loses a game, you know, stuff like that. But he means here to have pity, to be tenderhearted, to be tenderhearted towards somebody, to show pity. It doesn't mean that you act pitiful. And then be courteous. That word courteous is better translated be humble. Do you know it's difficult to be humble? Y'all might think, oh, well, that's easy. No, there's actually some tests you can give yourself to see if you're humble. If y'all have time, I'll give you the test. One of them is the precedence test. Um, how do you feel when somebody else is promoted over you? Uh, how do you feel when somebody else uh, gets more attention than you do? 
uh, are you okay if, uh, you know, if they outshine you in something, do a better job than you do? If it bothers you, then you're really not humble. You just think you are. And then what about the, the, uh, the test? You know, I'm not sure here how to say this, but a lot of people go around and uh, put their self down. You know, they say, you know, I'm no good and I'll never amount to anything. And uh, they think that's humility. That's not. It's like the man that got up at a prayer meeting one night and he said, uh, he said, Whatever I'm guilty of, he said, I, I may be guilty of a lot of things, but he said, I'm not guilty of being proud. And his neighbor got up behind him and he said, well, you don't have anything to be proud of. And the man said, well, I got just as much right to be proud as you do. Well, see, he really wasn't humble. Putting yourself down is not humility. And then the criticism test, and I'll be honest, I fail this one. How do you feel when people criticize you? You know, our teachers used to tell us that constructive criticism was good for us. It might be, but I still don't like it. I mean, I, I, so I guess I'm not humble. You know, I might, I might think I am, but uh, that one will get me. But if you can pass all those tests, you're humble. Humility is not going around putting yourself down. It's just not thinking of yourself at all. You know, thinking of others. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. In other words, we need to be forgiving of people. Now, it would be different if the Bible said just forgive your friends. We could probably handle that. But how do, what about our enemies? What did Jesus do on the cross? Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He wasn't talking about his friends. He was talking about those who were putting him to death. Verse 10, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. I'm sure it would be a generalization, but uh, that all of us have problems with our tongue. In fact, James takes a, a major, uh, James chapter 3, uh, to talk about the tongue, how can sweet water and bitter water come out of the same water fountain? How can we praise God on Sunday and curse our fellow man Monday through Saturday? You know, our tongue, a little old, little old thing in your body, doesn't weigh hardly anything, gets us in big trouble. Mine is that I say things that are inappropriate at the wrong time or, or, or just embarrassing stuff. And, and I feel like, you stupid, you know, I'm not ever going to say anything else. And next thing you know, I've done it again. You know, call somebody by the wrong name, yeah I'm, yeah, I'm not talking about robbing a bank now, but I'm talking about just being socially awkward. And it's our tongue that gets us in trouble. And it's our pride that keeps us there. If it wasn't for our pride, see, we'd ask forgiveness. The psalmist said, by the way, in Psalm 141, verse 3, put a, put a, uh, oh, I can't remember how he says it now, but guard my mouth, put a, a latch, put it, you know, guard it. Uh, somebody on Facebook one time, I can't remember the whole quote. It's not too good to give you half of it. But they were talking about, you know, Lord help me today to be kind and gracious to people and, and please put your hand over my mouth. In other words, help me not to say stuff when I want to, when I get mad and I want to say something. Uh, Verse 11, let him eschew evil. Eschew is an interesting word. It means run from evil. If you're on a path that's leading you into trouble, get off of that path. Turn around. Make tracks when you're tempted. If you're going into a place where it is easy to sin, don't go there. Now here's my philosophy about drug addiction, and I'll try to be as quickly as possible on this. Applin County has a drug problem. If y'all don't believe it, read the banner. See who they arrest. See why they get arrested. Jeff Davis County has a major drug problem. Uh, sometimes people, they have what they call drug addictions. And sometimes they get sent off. And as when they get sent off, they, you know, they have a, a controlled environment there. And, and those people 
they they're stay for so many weeks and, and then they come back. Okay, they were on drugs. They go to be dried out, but they come back. Guess where they come to? The same place they were. My theory is this, that you can never defeat drug addiction until you move away from where you are. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not drugs somewhere else. I mean, if you live in Baxley and move to Alma, it's not saying there's not drugs in Alma. But you don't know the people, see. And as long as you go back to the same crowd, I've seen it over and over. And, and I know it has to be a terrible addiction because people, I've had people tell me, you know, how they struggle to get off of it. They really don't want to be on this. But they go back to the same and they start hanging around the same friends. I mean, you can take it to the bank. They're going to be in trouble again in just a little while. They'll be busted again. You've got to run from evil. Do good. Christianity is not just about negative, what I don't do. I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls who do. You know, not that thing. Uh, <laughs> all right. Ansley, you make it worthwhile. I'd come here just for the apple. Uh, and seek peace and ensue it. In other words, we ought to try to get along with people if we can. Verse 12 is a verse that I dedicate to the intellectuals in the audience. I don't know. I know some of you are school teachers. I assume you're intellectuals. How did you get that job otherwise? Uh, this is a, a, one of my favorite little things here. Watch this. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Watch it now. We talk about the eyes of the Lord, the ears of the Lord, and the face of the Lord. In English, before I dozed off, I learned a big word for that. That's called an anthropomorphism. It means to give God human qualities so that we can understand him. Because God does not have eyes and ears and a face like us. God is a spirit, John 4, 24. But to make it where we can understand it, Peter talks about the eyes of the Lord simply meaning God sees everything. The ears of the Lord, he hears everything. His face or his, his countenance is against those who are evil. Like I told you all, the next church I'm going to is an English teacher. I can't wait to get to this verse. I hope I don't forget it before then. Verses 13 and 14, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? In other words, God is in control. God's in control. But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Trouble there means worried. I'm afraid I'm not doing too good with that verse. But if we suffer for righteousness' sake, I'll be honest with you, most of the time when I suffer, it's my own sorriness. I bring it on myself. <clears throat> Verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Watch this. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh for a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The English word the Greek word, I'm sorry, apology in English means answer. There is a study of theology called apologetics. In fact, last Sunday my wife handed me a copy. She said that uh, somebody at Satilla had wanted me to have this magazine. It was Mature Living. Now what would a young guy like me be interested in reading about these older folks? But on the cover was a picture of Ravi Zacharias. I meant to bring it tonight. He's the most famous apologetic person in the world. He is brilliant. He's so smart. I don't even know what he's talking about. He'll go to, you know, to Oxford and uh, to Yale and all these places and talk to the debate with the faculty and talk to the students and, and all that stuff. But apologetics, mean, it sounds like you're apologizing for somebody. No, it just means you've got an answer. 
uh, if you're a, and somebody told me one time that they were going to college to, to study Christian apologetics. I won't ever forget that, but I can't remember who it was. Uh, years ago, somebody told me that, that you can study, you can become, uh, you can get a degree in college on apologetics, which means a defense of the faith. When somebody brings up something, you are trained to answer and defend the faith. Now, I was at a church a while back, and I was there because it was a free meal. But they got to discussing, I thought all we were going to do was eat and leave, you know. They had a meeting. So I had to stay for the meeting because I'd already ate. And uh, they were talking about what if somebody asked you why you are a Baptist? Could you answer that? Do you know what most of those men said? Because that's the way they were brought up. Their, their parents were that way and they took them to Baptist churches. And that's why they're... Uh, I can honestly say that's not why I'm a Baptist. I wasn't brought up anything. We had a Methodist church right down the road. I never knew the difference back then. Yeah, I didn't know the difference. I knew the Methodists, they burned a few more candles, you know, than the Baptists. But I, as far as their preaching and singing, I couldn't tell the difference. But I, am, I can tell you why I'm a Baptist, because Baptists are the only people that believe in eternal security. That's the main reason. Now, some of y'all don't believe in it. I'd like to ask, why are you a Baptist? In other words... It doesn't mean here that you have to be able to debate with somebody that's got a Ph.D. from Harvard, but it just means you ought to have a reason for the hope that you've got. You ought to know what God has done for you, and when you tell somebody else what the Lord has done for you based on Scripture, that is a powerful argument. We ought to have an answer when somebody challenges our beliefs. We ought to have an answer. Verses 16 and 17, having a good conscience, whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. In other words, when the devil's crowd makes up stuff on you, just be glad that it's not true. They ought to have a good, you have a good conscience. The word conscience, mean, it comes from two Latin words. It means to know with. And you can have a good conscience do you ever hear your school teachers tell you, let your conscience be your guide? That's only partially true. Because if you do enough sin, your conscience won't bother you anymore. That's called a seared conscience, 1 Timothy 4.2. Uh, when you do so much evil, uh, you remember the first time you copied your neighbor's homework in school? How bad you felt? I thought I was going to be struck dead. You know, just copied their homework. But you know, after I did it the second time, I didn't feel nearly as bad. And after a while, it didn't bother me at all. So if a child is brought up in a home where there's drinking and, and cussing and, you know, all kind of uh, bad behavior, they're not going to think there's anything wrong with it. Conscience has to be instructed. And the Word of God is, if you study God's Word, your conscience will tell you if you're, and by the way, I can answer this. I couldn't have answered this when I started preaching. Whenever young people come to the preacher and say, preacher, do you think it's wrong if I go, you know, uh, to the ball game on Sunday? If you have to ask, it's wrong. <laughs> if you have to ask, you've already answered it because your conscience, a good conscience does right based on the word of God. A seared conscience is one that you've done evil so long that it doesn't bother you anymore. See, you wonder how these people, for example, can, are serial killers. How can they just kill people that they don't even know? It doesn't bother them. And then there's, there's the Bible speaks of a weak conscience in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. That's for usually for new believers or people who don't study their Bible. They have a weak conscience. And in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the problem was about eating meat. Some people were offended because some of the members in the church were eating meat that had been offered to idols. Others didn't see anything wrong with it. See, they had a weak conscience. I think that's what I had when I first got saved. I saw everything as sin. I mean, I was just afraid to do anything. 
But you know, after you study your Bible and you uh, you get a little bit better instructed on it. But there's your conscience is only as good as what you put into it, and it's from God's Word. Uh, now we have eight minutes until eight o'clock, but we're about to have this thing on the spirits in prison. This is going to get really deep. I think we might be better off to take an eight-minute break. I didn't really plan to do this tonight, but I've taken too much time, I guess, on this other stuff. I want you all to hear this about the spirits in prison. It's the most difficult passage in 1 Peter. It would be one of the ten most difficult in the entire Bible, I would say, perhaps even higher than that. So let's take an eight-minute break. When you all see me come back up and start, now we'll be ready. If you need to go to the restroom, if you just want to stand up, uh, whatever, just give you a break because this spirit's in prison will take us about 20 minutes. Uh, but we really need this tonight. If we put this off, it's going to be really hard to finish tomorrow night and do any kind of justice to the study.
Time's up. It's exactly 8 o'clock. Besides that, y'all are having too much fun. I mean, somebody's getting talked about. So we got to... Now, I'll be honest. This is for the serious Bible student where we're about to go now. If you're not really serious, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier. You could have just left because uh, this is going to get deep. But I'll do my best to make it as simple as I can. When I first learned, and I usually learn what the January Bible study is about July because I get on the Internet and I start looking up, you know, and uh, when, they, when I saw it was going to be First Peter, my first thought, and I'm serious, I knew there was this passage about the, the uh, spirits in prison, but I couldn't remember if it was First Peter or Second Peter. I said, oh, I hope it's Second Peter. But guess what? It's First Peter. It is one of the most difficult passages in the Bible. It, it starts in verse 18, and actually verse 18 is easy to understand. And verse 22 is easy to understand, but in between, we got, we, got, we got problems. Now, I want to make this clear as a disclaimer. Uh, there are many different interpretations of this passage. And any interpretation that you have, somebody can find a weakness in it. There is no airtight theory here. So what I'm going to do is give you what I think. But remember, you don't have to necessarily think the way I do. And, and I may get some of it wrong, but I'm going to do the best I can with it. It has been, I can tell you that there's been uh, a lot of misinterpretation of it. Some people think it refers to a second chance after death. That, you know, that Jesus went and spoke to these people that was already in, in dead and and uh, they give them another chance. Uh, some refer to it as purgatory. Uh, some think that Jesus went and spoke to just the people who lived in Noah's day. It is a problem passage. It's called a problem text. In the 19th verse, for example, there are nine Greek words. Of course, they're translated into English for us. But Bible scholars disagree about the meaning of all nine of them. That shows you we're in trouble. When Bible scholars, you know, who study languages and stuff, can't agree with what these words mean, it means the average person like us, we're way over our head. But I'll try to get us out by around 8.20 to 8.25. But he starts off here with something easy. He says in verse 18, For Christ has also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. All right, now that verse tells us several things that are important. First of all, Christ's death was unique. He only died one time. See, that's why he can only be saved once. You can join different churches. You can be baptized several times but you can't be saved But you can only be saved for how many times Jesus died he died once for our sin the second thing we learn in this is he did not have any sin of his own so he died for us we call that a vicarious suffering he suffered on our behalf in other words like that old song it should have been me that was crucified but it was Jesus uh, and then the third thing is to reconcile us to God. It says to bring us to God. So we learn three important things in that one verse. But it's easy to understand. But now we move to verse 19. Now before we start on this thing, and remember that even scholars do not agree on what this means. Be aware that when you have a problem text... There's a, a couple of things you need to be aware of. Number one, don't take a problem text, in other words, something that you're not quite sure of what it means, and use that as a basis to start another doctrine that you can't really substantiate by any other passage of Scripture. In other words, this passage is not teaching that Jesus did not 
that he left something unfinished on the cross and that he goes down in the grave now to talk to these people. And in other words, he didn't do this on the cross and, and he goes to complete it here. And uh, so, so don't get that idea. That's never taught in the Bible. And uh, also, don't get so focused on what you don't understand about this verse that you miss the good part. It's possible just to, to be so concerned about what I don't fully understand that you don't get the, uh, what, you, what you do understand there. And I always say this. It goes in one ear and out the other of people. The Bible is clear about most everything. But where it is not exactly clear, don't take an unclear passage and use that to override a clear passage. Let the clear interpret the unclear, not the other way around. Because the Bible is not going to contradict itself, right class? It's not going to contradict itself. So if there's something in the Bible that's clear, and then there's another verse a few books over, that a verse is a little fuzzy, don't take the fuzzy verse and say, well, we're going to go with that and ignore the clear one. Because see, like I told you, I believe in eternal security. And there are many, many verses in the Bible that teach that our salvation is, you know, in fact, we talked about it last night, I think, or either Sunday night. It's guarded, it's reserved, and all that. We're kept by the power of God. There are a verse or two that you can find in the Bible that, you know, it's sort of, unclear and then people start denominations that's why they have denominations they take stuff that's unclear and and they say well we figured it out so we're going to start our own church but anyway notice this by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison all right now sometime between the best the best way i know that i explain this is to use a bunch of simple words when did jesus do this sometime between his death and resurrection Jesus went and spoke to these people now uh, again realize that some people think that he's talking about a second chance and purgatory and all that stuff uh, some people believe that the spirits in prison and that's our next thought here is who, who are they we want to know uh, where did Jesus go who did he speak to and what did he say all right, those three things. Where, where did he go? Who did he speak to? And what did he say? All right, so where did he go? Now, and, and tonight, this, this just blew my mind. I was listening to the Catholic Channel on Sirius Radio on the way over here. And if y'all are wondering, why were you listening to the Catholic Channel? Because the comedies were not on the Radio Classics channel that I normally listen to. So I, flipped, and, and I did not like the guy that was in the, on the regular Christian channel because uh, he is a preterist and I, I don't believe in all that stuff, so I just flipped over to listen to the Catholics. Somebody called in, it was a question and answer program, and asked about the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, which I'm sure you all are real familiar with and deal with quite often here at Mount Vernon. But uh, there's a misconception in what's called the Apostles' Creed. In the Apostles' Creed, and by the way, you probably never use it here, right? I mean, I, I honestly, I don't even remember ever going to a church that says, let's all stand up and recite the Apostles' Creed. But you look it up. You go on the Internet, look it up. And I will tell you this, while we don't pay any attention to it as Baptists, Hundreds of millions of people every Sunday recite the Apostles' Creed. And they, they claim to be Christians. You know, I don't know. I'm not a judge. But I'm just saying this is important. It's not just, you know, it was done a long time ago. But in the Apostles' Creed, there's a phrase that goes like this. He descended into hell. In fact, that's what the question was about tonight on the Catholic Channel. In the Nicene Creed, it doesn't say that. And the guy was wondering, you know, had, were they uh, afraid to, to say that? Or, and why did they leave it out of the Nicene Creed, which was later? When the Bible, well, the Bible doesn't say this, but when the Apostles' Creed says he descended into hell, 
Jesus did not go to hell like you think of hell. When you think of the word hell, when you hear a preacher talk about hell, you think of a lake of fire, of torment, and, and all. Jesus did not go there. There are different words in the Bible that are translated hell in the English version. In the Old Testament, the main word that was translated hell was known as Sheol, spelled S-H-E-O-L. It simply meant the realm of the dead. It's often translated as the grave. It's the place where people went when they died. You know, they went to the grave, Sheol. But it's translated hell many times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Greek word that's translated hell is Hades. And, and that one shows up quite a bit. But when you think about hell fire, as in the final judgment, where people are thrown into a lake of fire, that's the word Gehenna. It's spelled G-E-H-E-N-N-A, Gehenna. And Gehenna was a trash dump in, in Bible times, in Jesus' day. It was right outside the city of Jerusalem in the Hinnom Valley. It was just an enormous landfill, but it was a place where they threw the garbage. But they also threw the bodies of dead animals. Uh, I, pro I, w I believe, I can't prove this, but the two thieves that died on the cross with Jesus were probably thrown into that dump. They usually threw, you know, people that were outcast, uh, could not afford a, uh, a decent burial or whatever. They threw them in the garbage dump. And fire and smoke all the time, 24-7. And that's the word that is translated in the New Testament as hell, as you think of hell. It is only used 12 times in the New Testament, 11 of them by Jesus. For all the people that think Jesus was sort of like Santa Claus, he just went around giving kids candy and saying sweet things to people. We know everything we know about hell comes from Jesus. But he did not go there. He went to a place, that the prison here, it's actually another word for hell called Tartarus, T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S. And he went there uh, to speak to, to these people who were there. And so I'm going to come to my next point. But here's the first point. Jesus did not go to hell as you think of hell. He did go to the grave, to a prison house, to a place in the underworld where some spirits were imprisoned. Now our next question is, who are these spirits? Who were the spirits that Jesus uh, went and spoke to? As I said, some people think they were the folks who lived in the days of Noah. Well, I can show you that Noah had something to do with, that uh, had something to do with this, but it does. In other words, some people think they were human spirits. You know, like our loved ones that's buried out here at the cemetery. That Jesus went and spoke to people like them, except that they were people that lived in Noah's day. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me because the Old Testament covers at least 4,000 years of history. The days of Noah were limited to 120 years. Why would Jesus just go and speak to people who lived in just a, that part of and ignore? all the other people in the Old Testament. So, I'll tell you who I think what makes the most sense to me. The spirits in prison, I think, are fallen angels or demons. Now, I'm going to give you some scripture, and because this is such a deep topic, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to, to show you these verses. But first of all, let me just mention in Genesis chapter 6, which is a lead up or a prelude to the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, the Bible says the sons of God took themselves wives of the daughters of men. Almost every Bible scholar will admit that the sons of God were fallen angels. That's the way they were described, sons of God. 
See, angels are invisible, but they can manifest themselves and become visible. And when they become visible, they're always in the masculine every time I've ever noticed in the Bible. I've never noticed a feminine angel. The problem with that theory is, and by the way, they got married. They had uh, an offspring of, of children who were like giants. They were like a monstrosity, a mongrel race. Uh, I believe that's why God destroyed that world by the flood. See, I've always thought there's more to this flood than we're being told. Because if you ask the average person on the street, why did God destroy the world in Noah's day because of the flood? You know what they'll say? Because everybody was so wicked. Well, folks, people are wicked today. Why didn't God destroy the world now? If you look through history, there's never been a time when the world has been righteous. There's always been wickedness, and it's always been prevalent. So why would he pick out Noah's day just to destroy them? I think that God had to cut this off because it was going to distort the bloodline that would lead to the Messiah if he allowed these, uh, this intermarriage of fallen angels and human women to go on. But the, the problem that people have with that is Jesus made a statement one time that the angels in heaven do not marry. And because of that statement, we have assumed that angels cannot reproduce, uh, you know, cannot marry and, and have children and all because Jesus said, but now watch what he said. He said, the angels in heaven do not marry. But what about earth? Now I'm going to show you two verses that will back up what I believe about these spirits being demons. Now all of them are not imprisoned. There are enough of them running around aggravating us. You know, some of them are running around. But they, these are demons. These are angels that fell when Lucifer rebelled against God. And some of them were so wicked. And, they, uh, and I don't understand how they manifested themselves, but that's what they did. All right, if you look at... Uh, Let's look at Jude for just a second. Jude's hard to find, but it's the next to last book before you get to Revelation. Jude only has one chapter. <coughs> it's, a, it's a book that gets no respect. It only has 25 verses. Uh, verse 6. Watch this. And the angels which kept not their first estate, meaning their original position with God, but left their own habitation. In other words, they were thrown out of heaven where they, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. All right, these everlasting chains here means in prison. They were imprisoned somewhere. All right, now 2 Peter which is just one book over from where we're at. Chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, da -da, but that's not Gehenna. That's not the lake of fire. That's a place called Tartarus, which is a special prison where God has them locked up cast them down to hell, but delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. All right, those two passages make it clear to me that the angels that were locked up are fallen angels, spirits in prison. So now the next question is, what would Jesus say to them? Because it says in 1 Peter 3.19, by which he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. If the spirits in prison were fallen angels, what would Jesus preach to them? We have no record in the Bible that there is a plan of salvation for angels. You know, in other words, that Jesus did not go there and say, hey guys, I know you all messed up when you rebelled against me, but I'm going to give you another chance. That's, that's not it. The problem, that, to me, the key here is the word preached. It's a different word than normally is used for preached in the Bible. See, when you think of preaching, you think of somebody that gets up, 
stands behind the pulpit, jumps up and down, foams at the mouth, raises his voice, lowers his voice, runs, jumps over the front pew. I mean, you know, we think of preaching as preaching God's word, giving an invitation, but that's not what the word means here. The word here means to make an announcement. Okay, 99% of Baptist churches on Sunday morning and probably Sunday night, but at least Sunday morning, will have a time for announcements. <laughs> it always amazes me. All that stuff's in the bulletin, but we have to make the announcements. And either Brother Darrell makes the announcements, and I have streamed to Mount Vernon before, and I've seen where Adams made the announcements. And Cole's probably made some announcements. And we, when we make an announcement, we just say what is going to happen. You know, we don't, we don't give an invitation then. We don't say uh, the WMU's meeting tomorrow night. Now, if anybody would like to be saved, uh, come on up, Brother Jonathan, and let's have us a hymn of invitation. We all stirred up because the WMU's meeting. Announcement just means they tell what's going to happen. All right, what Jesus did, and I'm confident of this now, but now, like I said, you can find a weakness. He went to the underworld where these fallen angels were imprisoned and announced to them that he had died on the cross and paid our debt and that their plan to ruin humanity had failed. In other words, he announced to the devil that the jig was up. That's what he announced in prison. He did not give them a chance to be saved. He simply went and made an announcement. I don't know what else he could have announced. He announced that he won the victory. It is finished on the cross, and their doom is certain. Now, to me, that's what it means by the spirits in prison. When did he go? Between his death and resurrection, somewhere over that weekend. Who did he speak to? Fallen angels. Where were they at? They were locked up because they had left their first estate. They had uh, messed around and tried to reproduce a race of people that would distort God's plan for humanity. And what did he say to them? The job is finished. All right. But now we run right out of that one into another problem. My head's already swirling from this one. But we're running this thing about baptism. And there are always people, and there's some in Appling County now. Don't you dare think they're not in Appling County. They're in Jeff Davis County. They're in Bacon County. Who believe that baptism is essential to salvation. Who believe that it takes more than just trusting Christ to get you to heaven. You have got to be baptized. And furthermore, you've got to be baptized in our pool. It ain't going to count if you were baptized at Red Oak or, you know, Satilla or somewhere. It's got to be in our baptistry. There are churches like that in this county. You, if you don't know who they are, I'm not going to tell you, but they're there. They're here. And, they're, and, and really, that's about all they'll talk to you about when they come to your doors, baptism. All right, but now notice this, verse 20. Uh, by the way, he does say here in verse 20, add a little bit about the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. See, that, why, that lets me know that whoever these people are that he went and spoke to were around during the days of Noah. And so that goes back to Genesis chapter 6 when the sons of God were intermarrying with the daughters of, of men. That was in the days of Noah. All right. But then he says, wherein, when the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Well, see, these churches that believe in baptismal regeneration, they jump on verses like this. As they see there, they were saved by water. But think about the flood. They weren't saved by water. Everybody in the water drowned. It was only the ones inside the ark that did not get wet that were saved. So something's amiss here. They were saved through the water would be a better translation. The water did not save them. 
the fact that they were not in the water saved them. Because the ark, see, you will never understand that passage unless you understand that the ark and the flood were types. The ark is a beautiful picture or type of the Lord Jesus. I'd, I'd love to chase this rabbit, but we, we won't, of how the ark was a picture of Jesus. So the only way of salvation now was to be where? In the ark. There was only one way, just like today. Now, the flood is a picture of God's judgment. That's obvious, isn't it? All these people die. It's God's judgment. The ark, they were, they were not in the water. They were out of the water. All the ones in the water perished. So it can't be that baptism saved them. They all drowned. The waters lifted the ark up. And he very plainly, I don't know how much plainer he could put it in verse 21, he says the like figure. That means that baptism is a figure, a type, it's a picture. The like figure whereunto even baptism does now also save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, meaning that baptism is essential for obedience, having a good conscience. But here's what happens when somebody gets baptized. They go into the water and the, the minister puts them under water. That's a picture of death. He brings them up out of the water. That's a picture of new life. It's a picture. Baptism is a picture, a type. But that water doesn't save us. Listen, dear, we've got to go home. It's already my bedtime. There are 150 verses in the New Testament that teach that we are saved by faith alone. There's one or two verses like this one that is a little fuzzy. I mean, I'll be honest. I wish it was a little clearer, a little fuzzy. But we can't take these verses that are, that are not clear and override all these other verses that teach that all we need, we're saved by trusting Christ and not by our works, not by anything else. Jesus is all we need. But see, they weren't saved by baptism. Baptism is a reference to death here. All those folks drowned. The ones that were saved were in the ark. So you're either in Christ or out. Well, here's our last verse. Verse 22 who is, and by the way, this one's easy to understand after all this hard stuff. But we've got another two hard verses coming up tomorrow night. Who has gone into heaven. That's where Jesus is now. He's not in the underworld proclaiming to the spirits in prison. Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Now, when the Bible says that Jesus is on the right hand of God, there are a couple things you need to be aware of. First of all, it represents co-equality. If you, if you can move and say, God, move over and let me sit beside you, you must be as powerful as God is because we aren't going to do that. We're not going to go up to God and say, God, you need to move over and let me sit here. So the fact that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father is a picture of co-equality. It's also a picture of authority because God ain't going to let just anybody come up and sit with him. It's a picture of authority. Y'all hear people talk all the time about, oh, I so-and-so died when they went to heaven. I bet they're up there, you know, uh, hunting or fishing or doing so-and-so. No, what did John do when he saw him in the Revelation? He fell at his feet as though he was dead. God is absolutely holy. Do you know one day every knee is going to bow to Jesus and every tongue is going to confess? That's Philippians 2.10. Now that doesn't mean that everybody will one day be saved, but it means that you'll have to acknowledge the authority of Jesus. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. 
Well, tomorrow night we have uh, two chapters, and most likely we'll have to split it up tomorrow night too, but we should be through. It is exactly 8.30, and uh, we should be through. In fact, we may be through a little earlier tomorrow night because these two, last two chapters are not as long. They still have some good stuff in them and some problem verses too, but not, it, it's not like the spirits in prison. That's a five-star problem text. Some of these others are about a two-star that we'll deal with tomorrow night. But if you will stand, we'll have a word of prayer. Appreciate you being patient with me. And I'm going to say this. I should have said this at the first, but I'm going to say it at the last. If this stuff goes too long for you, because I know y'all aren't used to sitting for an hour and a half, and if you, if you get to where you need to go to the bathroom or something, go. Don't sit here and be miserable. It won't bother me. I mean, I've been there. I, I, the thing I hate most is to be in church and just say, oh, I wish you'd hurry up. You know, I wish you'd hurry up. You know, I need to go. And the preacher just goes on and on and on. I mean, if, you, if you're in one of those, because I realize now as a, as a mature citizen, uh, since I've got the magazine, that the, it ain't like it used to be. You know, we used to sit in church all day. It wouldn't bother us. But now, you know, I, first thing I look for when I go to a new church is where's the restroom? You know, it's always the first thing I look for. It's not even the apple. It's, it's where's the bathroom at? So these last two nights have been a little bit longer. But please don't sit here tomorrow night and be miserable. If you, you know, if you, if you say, well, I wish you'd hurry up and have a break, just go ahead. It won't bother me. I used to teach school. If you teach school, nothing bothers you. Right? If I have a witness, nothing bothers you. You're used to unusual and odd behavior. So, it does, I, mean, I understand. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for helping me tonight. Um, and if I could have left out something, I'm sorry, but I'm sure there's some other things I could have added. But I appreciate the people being patient with me, and I pray you'll bless each one. And may we be safe as we leave. Thank you for the good news that Brother Darrell gave that uh, a couple of folks are doing better that were very, very sick. And I know Miss Marcia in particular has been in a long, long struggle. And uh, obviously uh, one day it will come to an end, but she's been such an encouragement to so many people. And I pray you'll bless her again tonight. And, and then for those who aren't doing so good, that you would be merciful unto them as well. And I pray that you'll let somebody leave tonight and have learned something, not just sat here, but have learned something from your word. And also maybe to be challenged to, to go and, and do more research on their own. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.